on the on the digital humanities. Um, and our, our guests for today uh, are all from uh, UCF. We have Dr. Uh, Bruce Jantz, Dr. Mike Shire, and Dr. Amy Giroux. Am I getting that right, Amy? I'm sorry. Close enough, Giroux. Giroux, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, each of them is is uh, it, it was asked here to um, come and present on uh, all of their unique uh, interests and and work on digital humanities. And so, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about today are um, the tools that they use, the type of research that they're doing, uh, and um, you know how that can apply to our own research or our own teaching to you know our own um, you know engagement with the humanities. So uh, with that said, I think I'm just going to turn it over to you, Bruce. I, I think that you're going first. And, uh, and then uh, do, you, do you have uh, slides that you're going to present for us? I do indeed. OK, well, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. So let me share my screen here. Here we go. We tried this before, so it should hopefully work. There we go. Everyone can see that, I hope. Um, so my name is Jens. I am the co-director of the Center for Humanities and Digital Research at UCF. And what I'd like to do in my portion of this talk is really talk a little bit about the history of the center itself. Um, you know, doing digital humanities is both about using tools and, and um, you know, doing the actual projects and work itself, but also a kind of institutionalization, I suppose, of the, of the, um, you know, of all of that too. It's, it's, easy to do these sorts of things just on one off basis. But what we really set our sights for many years ago at this point was to, you know, have a center for for this thing. So um, uh, originally, uh, when I arrived at UCF in 2003, um, I had directed a center in Canada um, called the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in the Liberal Arts. And uh, that was a college of about 1000 people, 1000 students. And so I came to UCF, um, you know, knowing full well that I was coming to one of the largest uh, universities in the country, and there was no humanities center here at the time, which I thought was surprising, uh, given the size. And so um, I started bringing people to some of them are in fact in this uh, session here. I'm glad to see some of my UCF friends and colleagues uh, with us as well. And so we started talking about this early on when I first arrived um, across across the College of Arts and Humanities, and um, you know, eventually it took a while, but eventually the, um, the you know the dean's office uh, saw our uh, saw the saw the wisdom of having a center that was both a kind of humanities focused center, but also a digital focused center, and so it was a kind of a hybrid sort of thing uh, uh, right off the top. Um, you know, we did not want to just be a digital humanities center and leave out, uh, you know, anything, anything else. Um, so in 2007, we became a center. Uh, we were given a space in a trailer near the dean's office and a small budget line. Uh, we happen to all have the same budget line as we did in 2007, which, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've been working on changing that over the years. So we started uh, slowly to... Um, to work on projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but you know, we worked on a number of things, but I guess the first major one that we worked on, um, well, there were a couple really. One was uh, Mark Kenrath's project and Mark is uh, the other co-director of the center. And it was on Charles Brockton Brown, who was a early American writer. And he was working on a kind of um, collection of all the original writings that Brown had done that had never been done before. And so, uh, Mark was able to get a couple of, uh, you know, pretty sizable NEH grants um, based on the fact that we had started to build capacity at UCF uh, in order to support a project. And that's, you know, when I'm talking about institutions uh, as well as projects, um, you know, the question of capacity is really important for, you know, being able to fund these sorts of things. Um, so the mission of the center, as you see here, is that uh, it is uh, to serve as an engine for cross-disciplinary collaboration, multi-institutional partnerships, sponsored research and publication, community engagement, and public humanities programming. Facilitates the exchange of ideas and sharing of knowledge through the co-hosting of workshops, consortia, and so forth, uh, conferences. So, 
you know, the, the core of that in my mind is the uh, ability to work across disciplines, not only within the College of Arts and Humanities, but beyond. And we very actively try and reach out to other um, institution, uh, other, other departments across CF and also uh, people at other institutions. Uh, we have projects with people outside of UCF. And I know Amy is going to talk <clears throat> a little bit more about uh, some of how we've done that, um, you know, in a moment. Um, this is who we are, just to put some uh, faces to the, uh, uh, the names here. Mark and I are co-directors. Amy, uh, who you'll hear from in a moment, is uh, associate director. Scott French, who's in the history department, is an associate director as well. Mike, who you'll hear from in a, in a moment, is research specialist and publications coordinator. And Connie Harper is our software developer. She's uh, a database um, person. And our you know, our hiring really come through the, um, you know, the Dean's office has seen that every time we add someone to the center, we take a leap forward in the kinds of things we're able to do. Our capacity again uh, um, goes up. And I think we've seen that with every, uh, with every person that's come on board. So um, we have, this is the, what the space looks like and a little bit of the context of this is that we recently got an NEH infrastructure grant. I guess that's a couple of years ago at this point. And one of the uh, parts of that grant was to expand our, our space from, from what it had been, uh, which most recently is uh, this uh, smaller space here up to this entire uh, space here. Um, and uh, that, um, you know, it took some negotiating, it took some politicking within the university. Uh, you know, there are many demands on space, especially in a large university like ours. But, um, you know, through the help of our dean and many others, we were able to secure that space. The grant we got from the NEH is a, a matching grant, which we are in the process of, of trying to, uh, you know, meet the matches on a year by year basis in order to uh, be able to um, you know, get the NEH to release uh, the money for, you know, what is not just the space here, but the equipment that we're putting in the space. And so we've uh, targeted some large scale scanners, some 3D scanners, uh, uh, film scanners, you know, a number of tools like that, that can um, really help both the projects and also classes that will, um, you know, be uh, using this space. So we collaborate with especially the history department, but other departments as well on, on um, you know, teaching digital humanities uh, it, within uh, specific contexts. Um, history, and we'll hear a bit more uh, about that later, but history has been especially active in, um, uh, you know, in integrating uh, digital humanities within their program. Oh, uh, um, the center uh, production shop, um, you know, if you're familiar with humanities centers, there could be a number of kinds of models of them. Uh, some of them are primarily focused on enhancing the intellectual climate on campus. Sorry about that. Um, some of them are focused on curricular or pedagogical support, uh, including grad student and undergrad uh, research support. Some are focused on faculty research, so uh, fellowships, travel funds, th so forth. And some uh, are focused on research projects. And so I call these production shops. And uh, that's really what we've modeled ourselves on being. And what that means really is that we go actively looking for faculty within UCF um, and also beyond who have a good idea, who have access to uh, material of some sort. Maybe they have a, an existing database. Maybe they just have um, you know, some kind of physical materials. Um, and, and they say, this is all good stuff in my area, but I don't know what to do with it. And that's, that's where we take our cue and say, well, here are the things you can do with it. Um, and we're going to hear about a few of those in a moment. So, you know, our focus has mostly been on production in the sense of uh, working on projects without trying to ignore these other um, kinds of mandates for centers. So, um, you know, we do actively try and, and add to the intellectual uh, climate on campus, both within the college and beyond. Um, you know, we do work with lots of grad students and undergrads as well, and we're um, closely tied to the, our text and technology PhD program, which, uh, you know, Mia uh, was uh, a student in. And, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, these are very rich sorts of collaborations we find. Um, you know, we, we really uh, help each other quite a lot. And we focus on faculty research as well to the extent that we can, although, you know, 
um, given the kind of budget that we have available to us, that's more limited than we would uh, like to have. Um, so the kinds of projects are the kinds of things that we engage in. Um, like I say, we do project support, and that really means right from the, you know, somebody somebody saying, I have a vague idea, I don't know what to do, and we help them think through uh, what that could be. We help them um, strategize how to put a team together, where to look for funding. We help them write grants. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, experience in figuring out institutional support for projects. Um, so we know about, you know, uh, data archiving and, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of the kinds of things that funders like to see, you know, nobody wants to fund something that's going to go away as soon as the, as soon as the funding dries up. And so we really try and, and, and show that, you know, we have the capacity to, um, you know, uh, do something more than just a kind of quick one-off sort of thing. Uh, we uh, support journal and publications, um, and Mike is going to talk about that. Um, we support conferences and workshops. Uh, we had the Haystack Conference. Haystack is a large organization focused um, not just on digital humanities, but, but uh, largely on digital humanities. Um, that was in 2017. Uh, the Zora Festival in town here, that happens every year. That's happening at the end of January again. And a number of other uh, conferences we've collaborated on. We have uh, sponsored things like Brown Bag Lunches, which is really intended to bring together project PIs and others involved, really just to talk about where things are and to talk about um, you know, just what, uh, uh, what their needs are, what their challenges are, how we can help each other, uh, what they've learned, you know, all of these sorts of things. You know, that kind of informal um, you know, uh, information exchange, I think, is, is really important. Um, we have gone out to departments. Uh, and people won't even realize that there could be a digital uh, aspect to some of uh, you know what they're doing and so we try and say hey have you thought about you know making a database out of what you're doing or, uh, or a visualization or uh, a game or uh, you know any number of other kinds of things and then we also you know work closely on technical support uh, with the college and with with uh, you know with others as well um, you know we continue to try and integrate ourselves into research at UCF. Um, you know, we are, um, uh, you know, we achieved a, a, a type three center level, which in the jargon of, of centers within Florida is a certain kind of official recognition. Um, but we do realize that the more, I guess, institutionalized we can be, the more um, we can demonstrate that we have the ability and, and, and funders will place trust in us in order to um, you know support the kinds of projects we want done, you know uh, we really want to initiate a lot of different kinds of interdisciplinary work, and not all of it is um, digital upfront. I mean, you know, discussion of medical humanities, narrative and humanities, space and place. These may have digital aspects to them, but um, you know they need not start with a digital app that might emerge after a while. You know, and as I said before, we try and collaborate with other colleges on projects, um, you know, we ask, you know, what's the humanity side to tourism, engineering, computing, gaming, you know, I work on uh, experience uh, in space, um, you know, long term space flight. Well, what's, what does humanities have to say about any of these things. And, you know, we work on more partnerships in Florida and, you know, all of this is to try and offer something to our people here that that they couldn't get on their own, essentially. The other thing we have is that um, we are part of CenterNet, which is uh, a worldwide uh, organization for digital humanity centers. And I would encourage anyone who is, uh, who's got a really even just a project. I mean, the notion of center is, is widely interpreted here. So it doesn't have to be literally a center. It could be some organization of some sort where you're working on digital things. Uh, you know, if you want to reach out to me about how to become involved with CenterNet, uh, I'd be more than happy to tell you about that. And so that's my slice of this, of this pie, an introduction to the center itself. And I will hand it over to Amy, who I think is picking up from there and gonna talk about some of the uh, projects that we've been involved in. So let me unshare my screen. Here we go. And uh, Amy, it's all yours. Thank you. Sure. Do you see my slides? Looks great. 
Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Giroux, and I am an associate director of the center. Um, I'm going to use our jargon for our center. We call it Cheddar, um, based on the acronym or the initialism of the center's name. So when I say Cheddar along in my uh, process here, it's talking about the center itself. So I've been here for a little over six years. I was the first full-time hire. And once we started to make connections across the college and beyond, I've found that multidisciplinary collaboration is one of the center's greatest strengths in my opinion. Get my slides going. So our collaborations really take a lot of different forms and our impact and reach is actually becoming more global recently with a lot more interinstitutional work that we're currently working on. So I'm gonna talk about some of our projects from a tool use perspective to show the ways in which our faculty have used DH tools for their projects. Some of which are direct collaborations with Cheddar and others are where we train grad students or faculty on different tools. And then they go and they work directly with their own teams and we're not involved after that training process. So when faculty and students come to us to discuss their research, it usually falls into one of two buckets. You know, the first is where someone has a lot of data that they've collected and they want some place to store it, you know, long-term sustainability, but they also want to be able to, you know, search within it, do their research with it, that type of thing. And then the other is where somebody has data and a research question and they're looking for some type of analysis tool. And I'll talk about some of those also. So our main um, collaboration in terms of database development or specialized tools for problem solving or teaching even has been the undergraduate computer science senior design teams. And I wanted to explain this briefly first as you'll see how these teams have helped us with various projects um, throughout our last five or six years since I've been here. And also, depending on your institution, there may be a similar way for you to do this type of collaboration with your computer science departments. So as part of their degree, the computer science students have to complete a two semester capstone course that has them work as a team to design and implement a solution to a sponsor's request. Now these projects give the students experience in project management, team communication, opportunities to work on you know, different computer concepts than they may have learned in class. But more importantly, in my mind, it winds up giving them a really strong line on their resume, <clears throat> showing that they've worked in a team environment from the design of a specific project to the completion of that project. Now I've sponsored over 20 teams so far and Connie Harper, who is our software developer and I pitched four more projects earlier in this week. And these projects that the students complete are, it depends on whether you get an A team or a C team, um, but typically they're like a prototype level. You know, you can use these to show granting agencies your proof of concept. And a lot of times this is, you know, what we're after is a way to, show the funding agencies that we can do this work um, and, you know, please pay us to do this work. So for example, we're in the midst of working on a grant proposal with the University of Hildesheim in Germany. And this is a database tool that will allow users to essentially explore and analyze works on the history of philosophy. And these works are worldwide, um, any language, any time frame. Uh, it's their goal is to collect all of them, you know, which may, may or may not be possible. But the students created a multilingual user interface um, with tag based filtering and some basic visualizations for the data. Now, it needs a lot of work to get it to the production level. But again, this is sufficient to show grant funders that we have a concept of how to implement the system and that the design that we have is you know, adequate to do the work that we're proposing. Another recently completed senior design project was a database and website for the Gravestone Project. This is a group of literary scholars and taphophiles here in the US and in England. 
And again, the database is mostly functional um, and of a level to show the NEH, which is where we're uh, starting for our attempted grant fundings there. Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language um, was a very important publication and still is an important dictionary. Um, our Supreme Court consults Johnson to determine what the founding fathers meant for certain terminology. So Cheddar adopted the original website, not the one shown on the screen here, um, but the original website, a independent scholar who was trying to crowdsource the transcription of Johnson's 1755 edition. And that site, it was a kind of hybrid. It was partially in WordPress. Um, she had started to convert it over to PHP, um, which is a programming language used to access databases. And the PI on this project is Beth Young, who's an associate professor in our English department at UCF. And we submitted a grant proposal, it's about three years now, and we were awarded funds to complete the transcription of both the 1755 and the 1773 editions of the dictionary. Now, this project is mostly text-based. Um, we're trying to, you know, transcribe it. We're TEI encoding each of the word definitions. We're using a tool, a database tool called Exist, which is a database specifically designed for XML. Uh, there's a tool called Oxygen, which is a XML editor uh, that we use to pre-process some of the XML, make sure it's configured correctly uh, for the database and so forth. And then we also have a portion of the site in WordPress um, we use this for documentation of the process that we're doing for developing the site. There's also um, blog posts about Johnson and, you know, different topics that don't really need somebody to program them to be on a website. It makes it much easier to have a, a WordPress. We essentially skinned it to look like the rest of the website. So it's seamless, but it is a piece that's in WordPress. And then we've had two senior design teams um, to help us. And we've also pitched two more senior design team projects for this uh, Johnson's Dictionary project. So the first team, um, we, <laughs> Johnson used quotations. Um, that's how he illustrated the head words. And the ones that Johnson used, let's just say he paraphrased a lot. Um, he also, I'm, it may not have been him in particular, but typesetting the dictionary, uh, they compressed things, they reworded things. So there's about 120,000 quotes in the first and fourth editions of the dictionary. And we wanted to try to validate these quotes and obviously with that many automate the research as much as possible. So a student team collected a corpora of text from online sources like um, Project Gutenberg. And then they created a Python algorithm that searches for the best match of the quotes within that and then stores potential matches in a database. And then they created a user interface where we can look through the potential quotes and see what ones the scoring routine decided was the highest probability of being the correct one. And then it allows us to mark whether you know, we agree with that or whether it's another one. So since the team actually completed this project a couple of semesters ago, we've actually found a couple of new websites that have better and more broad uh, corpora for us to research in. And the other problem is, is the algorithm they wrote is really not speedy. It takes about six months to process. Um, so we're, we've pitched another team to work with our um, UCF's high performance computing cluster to increase the processing speed and to go through the new sources. So the intent is to reprocess the quotes to see if we can get some better accuracy on them. And then the second senior design team, they helped us parse the dictionary pages into separate word images. There's about 43,000 words per edition of the dictionary. And some of these words, you know, the definitions would span a column, some even span multiple pages, um, since the intent was is to be able to display the image were, you know, the image of the definition next to the transcribed version of the definition, we needed to process these pages in a way that we could get that done. 
less intensively manually. So the students wrote a computer vision model for various steps in the process. And um, it was, it's good. I mean, we've used the process that they created, um, but in the end goal, some of the pagination, it was even uh, problematic by the typesetters would set things off by a fraction and then it would mess the algorithm up. Um, but we are having to do some manual processing after the fact for this group. Um, but this was another one that the computer science worked on. For um, mixed reality, we have a number of projects that work with virtual reality and augmented reality. We started this with uh, language learning tools, foreign language learning tools. And this is an area of research that a team of faculty and staff began working on in 2017. And the team is two professors from our modern languages department, um, one who is in the English department, uh, another person who is staff in the UCF's Office of Instructional Resources and myself. And L, uh, the name of the game here, stands for Endless Learner. And what we've been looking at and testing is how different modalities of content delivery affect student learning. So we currently have nine different iterations of the foreign language learning, and it also incorporates um, linguistics games. And these were all developed by computer science teams. The games go through as you're playing them, they'll anonymously log the gameplay. So our studies, we've used pre and post tests and the log files to look at the efficacy of the platforms that we're using. And we've received two internal grants for these projects, um, including one recent one that we were able to buy six of the VR headsets and a laptop and a cart for us to be able to pack all this in the card and take it to the classroom for the students to use. Um, needless to say, the pandemic has made a mess of that plan, um, but we're hoping to make a system, or actually we're working on a system to allow students to check out the headsets for practice so that they can um, use it. And again, we can use the data that is generated um, to determine whether they're effective or not. And then the other VR project that we're working on is called the Middle Passage. This is run um, by a history professor and it places the user into the experience as a captive who's about to be put on board a ship and ultimately ends on an auction block in Brazil. Now, this experience was also developed by two computer science teams and we've done studies in uh, different history courses at UCF and also among community members in our area. And since all of these mixed reality projects are research oriented, we've worked very closely with our IRB to make sure that our studies you know, follow the protocols um, for ethical uh, research. We've also proposed another VR project this week that is um, co-sponsored by the National Park Service at the Castillo, the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. And that is to create a VR experience of the fort that their educational department will use um, for research and uh, for those people who can't actually travel to St. Augustine. So I've talked about some of our collaborations with faculty and other institutions based on projects supported by our undergrad computer science students. But I also wanted to talk some today about tools that were developed by other researchers um, that are open source and also helpful for digital humanities uh, projects. Now I showed this particular network diagram earlier. Um, this was created in a project or a um, program called Gephi which is one of the tools that I also wanted to briefly talk about. Um, Gephi we're using in a, a project, it's called Print. Um, I'm actually co-director of this project. And we are collecting German, English, and Dutch letters written by um, different religious dissenters between 1630 and 1730. That's the, the focal of the time frame. And the history professor that runs this project is looking at the communications networks 
that were created to um, essentially not only alleviate like religious persecution between them, but they also would use these networks to inform their members about migration. So like, for instance, uh, there are Dutch Anabaptists who sent letters to um, and money and household goods and stuff to help Swiss ex exiles. Um, there's also Quaker missionary William Penn. He recruited Pietists and Anabaptists to come to, you know, the colonies in that day, his colony. And he used these networks to send promotional materials and ways for people to figure out what boats to, to book passage on and things like that. And these networks are really not easily condensed into like a 2D map for a book. So the professor reached out to me about her project and said, you know, I, she can't envision this being, you know, a map on a page. So what can we do to analyze this information? So GEFI is a network analysis program. And it, as this um, animated screen shows you, it allows us to have a timeline so that we can actually see the movement of the letters over space and time. Now this animation, it is geographically associated, but we don't have a background map within Gephi to make it look that way. So if you, the upper left cluster is England, um, and then the cluster that starts to build later on and the lower right-hand side is the you know, European continent. Um, and this is where we started with our first geographic rendition of this data. Um, and, if you really think about it, just with this kind of visualization, you can also start to think about mobility, you know, how networks shifted across space as people moved uh, and over time, obviously. So the tool allowed us to see the development of denser and more stable networks over time. And um, like I said, this Gephi tool, it's free, it's open source, um, you know, it's, it's available to anybody who may have networks that they're interested in examining. They don't have to be geographic based. Um, we've also analyzed our letter data just based on the, the people themselves, how many letters they've sent and so forth, just to see the connections between all the letter writers. So it doesn't necessarily have to be geographic based. It's just networks in general. Print um, was also selected for an NEH funded crowdsourcing institute where we're working on getting um, the first set of letters into Zooniverse for crowdsourcing the transcriptions. Now Zooniverse, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but it started as a science-based uh, crowdsourcing classification platform. You could go in and classify galaxies. You could go in and classify types of ducks. You know, it was a way for people to researchers to crowdsource their data analysis, but they're really, really working hard on trying to make it usable for humanity scholars. So we're about halfway through. Um, it's an 18 month cohort and our team is trying to get hopefully get to beta testing in February. And this screenshot is an example of the transcription tool that lives within Zooniverse that they've created for humanities projects. And this is one of the letters that we're trying to have people transcribe. They're awful. Um, but users essentially will come into this tool. They'll draw a line under each line on the page, and then they'll transcribe that line into a text box. And the way it works is that three people are needed to transcribe each line or agree on the transcription for each line before the document gets, you know, said that it's done. Um, our first set is all in English, but eventually we plan to have a multi-step process where we're gonna crowdsource the transcriptions of the German and Dutch letters, and then a second pass through Zooniverse for um, actually translating them into English. So if any of your projects involve manual transcriptions, you know, versus having OCR or some other type of machine learning, I would suggest looking into creating a Zooniverse project. They're very supportive of what the work um, that humanity scholars are doing. And there's a lot of projects already out there um, that you can take a look at that have, you know, humanities based uh, data in them. The next tool I wanted to highlight is called Orange. Um, this is a widget-based uh, data mining tool. 
that allows you um, to analyze for our purposes text documents. This again started as a scientific based um, source. They were looking at DNA and all kinds of uh, genomic properties, um, but they built a text based data mining wizard uh, type plugin that allows you to analyze text in many, many different ways. So I've used this project to analyze things from uh, newspaper articles on immigrant farm workers from like the early 20th century. I've also used it to analyze uh, tweets on COVID-19 from 2020. So it's really versatile and it's all widget based. Um, the little circles in the screenshot on the left, those are their widgets. You essentially drag and drop them on the, the workplace connect them together with your mouse and it does its thing. So it's essentially a plug and play. And for Orange, I actually do a guest lecture in our writing and digital environments course. And I teach the students how to analyze their data. Um, and then Mike may talk about his piece in that in a little bit. And I've taught these workshops for Orange at Digitorium, the conference that they have at the University of Alabama. And I've also done it at a NEH sponsored Digital Cultures Institute that we had at UCF um, early on in the pandemic. And the intent with some of the other projects we're working on is when we get further along with like Johnson's quotes or the letters in print, we plan to analyze that data within Orange also. And then the last tool I wanted to introduce was Leaflet.js. Uh, Leaflet is a JavaScript library that allows you to build interactive maps for your geolocated data. Um, we first used Leaflet for our Veterans Legacy Program work uh, with UCF's uh, History Department and the National Cemetery Administration. And the history students wrote biographies that were then accessible via a map of the cemeteries. And our students, um, they actually collected the GPS coordinates for each of the graves, and they also took all the headstone photos. So it's a, a geolocated um, set of biographies of, of American veterans. And then for another project for the National Cemetery Administration, I worked on uh, digitizing methods for the physical spaces of the cemeteries and to create a resource for analyzing the data on a more broad scale, you know, not necessarily an individual uh, person, though you can still drill down to that information, um, but more on, um, you know, the, the global of the, the cemetery. And this particular example is St. Augustine National Cemetery, and the headstones um, are color coded by branch of service. But if you look at the other options in the, the choice, uh, the layers choices, you could look at them by conflict, you could look at it by emblem of belief and, and gender and so forth. And this was all done in Leaflet. Um, now you'll need a little bit of programming skills um, to plug this in a website, but it's really pretty straightforward. Um, the data collection for the headstone polygons was actually the most time consuming. Um, this is a small cemetery, and it took us about 150 man hours to mark all of the, the headstones in this particular cemetery. And since I was tasked with working on much larger cemeteries, um, this is a screenshot of Alexandria up in the DC area. Doing that manually wouldn't have been efficient at all. So again, I reached out to collaborate with the computer science students. And they created an app that takes my uh, geo-referenced uh, map. This is actually created from drone imagery. Um, I, I fly a drone over the cemeteries and map it. And then they uh, taught a computer vision model to look at those um, images and to detect what is a headstone. So their model in some cases was even able to identify headstones under the tree line. And then the system creates all of the polygons, um, geo-reference polygons for me. So the system goes through, it identifies all of the headstones. If it misses some, I can you know, draw them in myself. And then it exports the data as a geo-json file, which essentially means it's, it takes the corners of each of the polygons and gives me the proper latitude and longitude of those four points. 
And then I'm able to merge this geographic data with the burial information and use it on the website. So this collaboration with those students is going to save an extraordinary amount of time as they said they can actually process up to 35,000 headstones in a, a single GeoTIFF image. So it, th these collaborations are, are awesome. I've really um, enjoyed working with the students. And then based on those leaflet maps, we're also able to pin just about any type of media on it. So I've created some ground-based um, 360 immersive videos that I then geolocate with through leaflet and pin it on a map. And I'm gonna stop at this point and I'm gonna hand this off to Mike um, to talk about some of the tools he uses and he teaches as he actually taught me how to work with the 360 videos um, through the Adobe suite. Let me stop my share. Hi, everybody. Let me just get set up and share my screen. Um, hold on one moment, please. In the meantime, it closed my keynote, which is not appropriate. Hold, please. <laughs> my computer decided I didn't need to do this right now. Let's see. While you're doing that, Mamie, do you think you could drop the links to some of your veterans' legacy project stuff into the chat? Because that seems like something that Sure. Um, some of our chats interested in taking a look at. I will do that. Thank you. And perfect timing. Mine just decided it was working again. So let me share my screen. Dun, dun, dun. But yes, um, thank you very much, Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike, Mike Shire. Um, I am a research um, specialist, and I'm also the publications coordinator for our center. Um, and so keeping in line with the theme of what's been going on so far, uh, I'd like to share and talk with you about some of the tools that we use here at the center. Um, and also um, some of the projects that we've done that might be familiar things to you, but you might not know how they're done. Um, and then hopefully that can be a generative thing for everybody. Um, so one thing that I do, one thing that I miss about being together with everybody in person is the sort of collaborative nature of our center and is a physical space where people can come in. People come in asking Amy because they are seeking Amy's expertise in a certain thing. Um, but then I can just eavesdrop and over here and things that I might know how to do in a different way um, that might be able to help out a kind of project. And so this is something that has happened repeatedly and why I have gotten inserted, as I said, I am a research specialist and I'm a publications coordinator, but I will be talking about things that aren't necessarily about publications. Um, and I think through that digital humanity seems to be this kind of thing that allows people to, um, to grow in their proficiencies and sort of learn to apply their things to new contexts. Um, so one of the projects that we all did together uh, was this thing called the, uh, the Hackathon, which is a segue from Amy talking about the 360 videos, um, where we were working so much with these 360 videos, which are shot with, if you're not familiar, just these little, just these cute little cameras that have these two little bulbs on them um, that allow you to kind of pan and look around the entire scene of somewhere that you happen to be at. And we thought about applications for this in terms of historical preservation, especially in COVID times, setting up these cameras somewhere and allowing people to visit them and look around and spatially experience them um, visually and audibly and, and orally, should we say. Um, and in that case, we thought this was something even before COVID to share with folks. Um, and I'm glad that we did this. So we led a workshop, we taught faculty and students how to, um, how to work in with these videos and how to use um, Adobe After Effects in order to edit them. Um, if you are not familiar, I know that a lot of universities now have access to the Creative Suite. I'll be talking about a number of the programs today, uh, but After Effects is, to, um, so Premiere is I'm editing my regular video and I just wanna get things in order after effects where I wanna add my special effects to those kinds of things, right? And so we were working on augmenting um, and displaying these videos to folks. And we had a nice, I wanna say about a 30 person turnout, imagining 30 people in that room together right now, that's kind of strange. Um, where we got hands on time to walk around and talk through um, how to work with these things. We provided them with 360 videos that we had already shot, um, which look like this when they are on a flat plane. Um, and we made it so that we taught them how to change them, edit them, look around all the things and to augment it with different text or different images in order to point out points of interest along the line, right? Um, and this was a really good example of how the sort of 
the technological thing that's kind of scary, which are these videos that look kind of mutated to you. Um, and we also got to teach people how to work with them. And then we had them brainstorm about ideas that they could use in their own projects. Um, now more, a little bit more in line with things that I tend to do um, as the publications coordinator, um, we had, hold on, let me move these. Oh, I'm starting the videos now, thank you. Um, so what typically happens lately is that we will have a faculty member who knows that I exist in the center and they will assume editorship of a journal. Um, and this has happened several times in recent memory, but the one of the more recent ones has been early American studies, one of our history professors, uh, Rosalind Beiler, um, has assumed the editorship of this journal that already existed. And the thing that she wanted to be able to do, um, it's a print journal, um, and what she wanted to do was completely redesign it, you know, just kind of take out the carpets and put in her own, which I think is respectable. Um, so what, what you do when you have any kind of print project that comes through another Adobe suite program that you're gonna to wanna to use is InDesign for this, anything that is print related, anything that has to do with a physical object. Um, and I understand this is a digital humanity center, but of course all of these things start digitally now, right? Um, so I use InDesign obviously to do layout of both covers and the interiors of um, a physical book objects. Um, we do um, chat book, a chat book collaboration series with the Florida Review, which is our literary journal. I'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, but also when these new journals come in and they need a new print thing, I tend to handle it. So it helps me draft different ideas. Um, this is a fun moment because I actually get to show ideas that were scrapped that never got used for this journal. So these are these are my little orphan designs. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry, but um, you're going to leave the screen again. Um, but it allows me to kind of to go through and to actually work um, and make everything the proper exact way it's supposed to be for printer specifications when I'm doing any kind of work like this. So you don't wanna work this in Photoshop. You don't wanna do that kind of thing because this is all gonna be in CMYK. It's gonna be everything that you need for if you have any media that you need to reproduce in a print fashion, this is the program that you're gonna to want to use for it. And of course, this is the final jacket that we ended up going with. And I'm happy to say it is off at the printers. And this will, um, if you subscribe to Early American Studies, so here is a nice little preview um, for you. It is forthcoming and it will be in your mailbox soon. Um, what is the next one? Okay, so in terms of publications, we also have our digital publications, and one of our um, one of ours in the College of Arts and Humanities is um, Aquifer, which is an imprint of the Florida Review. So the Florida Review is the print journal that we have, which you can see here on this page. Um, but we have a digital arm of that, which is something that we'll republish stuff that we can't necessarily publish in the actual printed book. As much as I love printed books. They're not very great for um, videos, should we say. Um, they're not very great for full art spreads because we do visual art, we do photography, we do um, video digital stories, all kinds of interesting things that we just simply can't print inside of a book. And the tool that we use for this, um, this particular website that we have is we use WordPress, which I know that WordPress is something that most of us are familiar with having used on the back end before. Um, but if you're not, it is a very simple, I guess is what we used to kind of call it. It features a WYSIWYG editor. I don't know if we still use that term, you know, what you see is what you get. You don't have to know any real coding to be able to handle this. A lot of drag and drop. Um, you can't, the code will take you kind of far if you do know how to use code. Um, so it's both inviting for newcomers and it's something for people to tinker with if, they, if they're that kind of person. Um, just if you've never seen it before. So we have a publication schedule for this journal. Um, aquifer where we publish things at least on a weekly basis typically more than that it depends like there's a queue of some things every week but then we also have things that get interspersed because we suddenly have some nice new portfolio of art that we would like to share with everybody um so just so you know this is all it looks like on the back end if you are scared of coding or you are a person who does not know how to do these things if you would just like to type your story in here or type whatever your post is in the visual editor you can drag and drop images you can do all kinds of work without having to know how to code um, we use wordpress for a number of our websites on campus um, and a couple of our journals and i'll talk about the differences between why we would choose one or the over over the other but the reason that we use wordpress for this one is the sort of print schedule that we happen to have with it and we also have a large archive of all of our um, print issues um, going back since the 70s um, and if you go to um, floridareview.ca.ucf.edu you can check out the website and see all of the cool stuff that we have but also if you happen to know code a thing that you have available to you in wordpress is you can click over um, to the text editor and you can start to insert short code I would, you can't, I mean, you can technically put in CSS and all kinds of stuff in here if you really wanted to, um, but this is a place for if you need that fine tuned control over formatting and everything, you still have that available to you as well. And then this is just a sample of the way that some of our stuff ends up looking um, after we publish it. So another, this is a fun one. So Johnson's Dictionary, um, Amy talked to you all about this um, a little bit earlier. 
Um, and I hope you all caught that really cool walk and cat across the screen on one of her images because that um, brightened my day significantly. Um, but so this is a project that you heard about in a different context, but something that I had overheard and something that had happened before was they discussed the need for all of these images, these thousands of images of these pages um, of this dictionary, um, they needed them watermarked. And I remember um, for a separate project as well, overhearing about, well, how long it was going to take for somebody to open all these images individually, to put a watermark on them, to save them, to compress them, to do all of that work. Um, I'm here to tell you there's something that can do all that for you very, very easily. Um, and the answer is Photoshop. Um, a lot of people think of Photoshop as something that makes people look like they're not um, actually human anymore and they are just airbrushed. But Photoshop is a tool that does like a million different things with images. And I think that one of the most important things it can do is it can do batch processing. And through that, what it can do is it can actually automate all of your processes for you if you happen to have a very clear flow. Um, so for us, that was a matter of we had the images and we wanted to place a little watermark down here at the bottom left that just um, attributed who it was from um, and, and giving our thanks for that, basically. Um, and in Photoshop, what you can do is, if you're not familiar with it, there is a portion on the side where you can automate processes. And basically what it does is it records you doing what you're doing to one image. And so that could be resizing, that could be opening, that could be cropping, that could be applying something to it, really anything you can think of, anything that you would click in it, it records your click. And then what you can do is you can then choose the folder and you can apply that series of clicks to every single image that's in that folder and tell it how to save and export them. Um, and ultimately what we did was we had, and this is all it was, I mean, it, th this sounds like a lot of explanation just for this, but imagine somebody having to manually do this for every single image over and over and over again. And then the process, which you can also automate into there, is the idea of compression and making sure that the images load quickly on whatever website it is that you're trying to put up. Um, so I think that this is a tool for, I can think of the applications for so many digital humanities projects, especially archives, especially um, large databases that are going to be online. If your images need to be processed beforehand, um, don't overlook Photoshop as something that can not only do it, but like kind of do it for you, um, which I think is a really important way to kind of think about some of these tools. Sometimes I feel like the tools are running other people's lives where I'm like, no, 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 sit back, let it do its work. Um, I want to talk about another project, another journal that we have um, in the college. So this is um, distinct from two of the other ones that I've spoken about. So this is Pro Studies, um, which is Anna Jones in, in our English department, um, who also recently assumed editorship of the journal. It is a print journal. It's Taylor and Francis. It's a, it's a real deal, um, but their web presence was very low. And so they came to me and they said, we're keeping the print journal. We're doing that the way that we're doing it, but we would like to have um, a website. And it's going to be something similar to Aquifer, which is to say it's a separate, a separate thing um, but it's still tied to the print one. So what I did for this one um, is we decided since this is a journal that's going to have large, um, longer form articles, um, things that are that are going to be fit to print, for instance, in their print journal that is still scholarly. Um, it's still scholarly. It's still peer reviewed. Um, but they want images. There's things where multimedia is going to be important, um, and so that's why they decided they're going to have some things where the writers get to write about their writing. Um, and they get to include ancillary information that they didn't get to in the finally printed version. Um, but these are much longer pieces, but they're also not published very frequently. And so for that, we wanted the fine-tuned control to be able to use um, not a platform so much as just a framework. And so we went with Bootstrap. And if you're unfamiliar with Bootstrap, what it is, um, is it is a a code set that you can go and you can get freely um, from Bootstrap's website. It is totally free to you. Um, and it's basically just a series of JavaScript and CSS files that they've taken care of a lot of that web styling already for you. And they have all sorts of documentation that I'll talk you through. Um, but if web design is interesting to you and it's a little itty bitty bit scary, Bootstrap does a lot of the work for you already. So you don't have to make all these big decisions about how something's going to look beforehand. And I did want to call out especially that we do not use uh, WordPress for absolutely everything on campus, um, our own, center's website that you can check out, um, cheddar.ca.ucf.edu. That is also something that is built on a um, bootstrap backbone that I've kind of grafted a bunch of stuff on top of. Um, but this is the kind of website um, that you can create with it. So if you just go to bootstrap's website, you can see they have extensive documentation to help you build your website. Um, anything that you want to know how to do, they have a little section for it for you there. They also have templates that are available. So again, if you have a project that you're starting with and you get, you need a website, but you don't have, I don't know what the resources are at every university. Some places you can't just say, 
I want a WordPress and they give me get and they give you a WordPress. This allows you to work on a website. You don't even need a server. You can do it on your own desktop. You can just edit the HTML files yourself. You can check it in your browser and you can send it to somebody else to upload later. Um, they offer all sorts of buttons. They offer all sorts of color um, coding that's already built into the system. Um, so I think it's actually very helpful for that. And then one other thing that we did that I wanted to talk about just a, as a roundabout way of talking about another one of our tools. Um, so we hosted the Electronic Literature um, uh, Organization Conference at UCF. You, you may notice this was in July 2020. So when we started planning this conference, it was, of course, an entirely in-person conference. And then as the world turned into the current world that we have, it immediately turned into a web-based conference. And at the again, at the outset of this, I was the web chair for the um for the organization which just meant building a website but suddenly the web chair became a very important person in this process um luckily we were already using a platform um to solicit all of our submissions um and that's something that we have available to us at ucf uh, through um, our library um other institutions might have something similar so i'm just wanting to call this out um it is called bpress anybody who has worked with it on the back end might tell you that it is a somewhat frustrating um I don't want to call it a program, but a, a sort of frustrating tool um, to be able to use. But it, it has tremendous power because it is a thing that allows you to both accept submissions to your conference. It allows you to review those submissions. It allows you to submit them to folks for anonymous blind review. It allows you to request um, those revisions. And then directly from the program itself also allows you to schedule your conference or if it's a publication, whatever order it happens in, in your actual journal publication. You can order all of those things together and then you can publish it. Um, and if you go and you find this conference online, it still is the repository um, that fully has all of the videos and all of the presentations that everybody gave to us at the time. Um, and so it's a one-stop shop for accepting stuff all the way through archiving it. The website exists currently, we don't have to touch it anymore, and we continually get reports on how often reports are accessed and how often talks are, are viewed by other folks. Um, we even get somewhat creepy maps that show us kind of sometimes down to the street level where people are viewing this content. Um, Sorry if that's scary, but that's the truth. Um, and yeah, so all of these projects though that I'm talking about, I, I'm working with very different people in all of them. And I kind of wanted to, um, I kind of wanted to close with just a nice little image of um, all the people and some of the people, uh, Mia somewhere in there, um, who, who we've worked with over the years on these projects because in sort of digital humanities, you know, we talk about the digital all the time, but you know, these are the, these are the people, this is the, this is the humanist part. These are the people who we uh, work with and we help. Um, and we like doing our jobs. So that's my little talk. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'll stop the share. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're just about at an hour. And so um, we're going to open up uh, the discussion to the audience and, and let everybody uh, ask questions of our three panelists. Let me start with uh, a question, um, you know, and it's not just aimed at you, Mike, it, it's really aimed at, at everybody. Um, so when, it, it, I mean, you, you run this center and you, it sounds like you have people who come to you and they say, I have this problem. And through conversation and collaboration, you kind of troubleshoot. You may not necessarily know where it's gonna go, but just through this collaboration, you find a way to, to sort of make that vision possible, right? And I guess um, like the, the, the question that I have is, you know, given how many people from the community and, and from the faculty that, that you guys serve, um, you know, do you have a resource or are you aware of a resource out there that, you know, might give people uh, and some ideas for how to think creatively in their discipline. Like, you know, we have people, you know, in our, in our chat community here who are in economics, people who are in history, people who are, you know, who work in, you know, um, performing arts. And they may not necessarily, they may like hear about something as cool as orange and they may not necessarily know how to apply it to their discipline. And I guess, so the question that I'm, I'm sort of ask, asking here is, are you aware of a resource that sort of says, all right, this is how digital humanities uh, or how these digital tools, it doesn't have to be humanities, how these digital tools apply to this discipline? Who's going first? I guess I'll go quickly. You know, in some ways, it's really a discipline by discipline sort of issue. I mean, if you look in history, for example, I think there are 
sites that that are pretty uh, elaborate on the kinds of projects that have been um, you know, uh, done in history. Uh, same thing with textual studies in general. My own uh, discipline of philosophy is not so good on that. They're, they're, um, you know, I keep looking for what I call the killer app in, in philosophy, you know, the thing that convinces philosophers, oh yeah, now I get it. Now I get why digital, you know, tools are relevant to what we do. You know, that's already, that already exists for history. It already exists for textual studies. It already exists for a lot of other uh, uh, things. So, um, you know, there have been uh, various kind of sites and tools that have come up over time and then they, uh, you know, they, they get old and sometimes they're not supported anymore. And so it's a little hard to, you know, know where to point people, but maybe I'll hand it over to Amy and Mike and, and they might have some uh, uh, more concrete ideas. I really don't know of like a one-stop shop, you know, for a website to go and see what things are applicable. Um, but there are community um, mail lists, there's um, Slack, if any of y'all are familiar with Slack, there's a very robust DH um, Slack channel that allows folks to go out and, you know, ask these kinds of questions, you know, talk about your project or, you know, ask for help on uh, specific things. Um, we had started at one point to collect a set of tools to, you know, write ups on the tools and stuff for our website. Um, but a lot of the time when you, like Bruce was saying, you go to, to use a tool that somebody else had used in the past and then you find out it's not supported anymore. Um, you know, so some things where they come and go, um, it's harder to, to, you know, say that these would be a good thing to, to use for your particular project. Um, but the, the main thing with the different disciplines, we got involved um, through a lot of the different apart departments by going and talking to the departments directly. Um, Bruce and I would go out at the beginning of fall semester, set an appointment with each of the departments in the college, you know, go do a half hour um, spiel about, you know, this is our center, this is what we do. You know, y'all need to think about ways, you know, that, you know, think about your data differently, think about your work differently, and maybe we can find a, a DH piece that would help you with your research. Um, you know, so we did that kind of thing, but until you speak with somebody individually about their research, it's really kind of hard to just say, this tool is good for that discipline. You know, it may be a mixture of tools that you wind up with um, for a particular project. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, in terms of it being a resource that folks can find, I, I've always just similar to what they've said, I felt like we're kind of the resource, you know, and it, and it was a lot easier to be that on campus, but it was as simple as we like to come and give these kinds of talks, um, but also just around campus promoting or talking about the projects that we're currently working on people, they go, huh, how could I use that thing? And I think when these tools kind of take over and proliferate, it's something like I've seen, like we had like one project that was using leaflet, for instance. And then somebody sees that, oh, I can make the maps do this thing. That sounds like something I could use. And so it really is just about trying to be that resource because I don't know, again, we have collected things for the website to put on a list of tools or a list of these things, but it's it's hard to even, even me as a person who knows these things, it's hard to wrap your mind around what they can do until you sit down to do them. And you know, everybody knows this from projects that they've conducted as well. Like it doesn't always look like you thought it would because the tool is what's going to shape um, the way that it turns out. So it, it's always very getting in there, I think, is the resource. <laughs> you know, I'll underscore what Mia just posted as well. FLDH, which is the Florida Digital Humanities Consortium, um, you know, has resources. Um, Centernet has resources, uh, you know, a number of others. And really, you know, if you have a, a vague idea and just want to shoot an email to one of us at, at UCF, I, I would be happy to, you um, you know, think through things with you and point you to resources in your own university or, um, you know, we're always open to collaborating as well with people. So, um, you know, we, we feel like, you know, we're here for UCF, but we're here for, you know, others in the state as well as much as we can be. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Sorry to 
So I had a question. I always like to hear what other instructors and faculty are thinking about this, but um, how do you get the reluctant students, the students that are afraid to play around with technology, the ones who aren't quite sure of the programs and are, are really afraid to work with these tools, how do you get them comfortable with those programs? I'll let you go first, Mike. Okay, I was like, I want to give space to other people. But okay, um, but, but no, I mean, Amy and I uh, will go and, and we guest teach in um, one of our colleagues' classes about sort of using these tools. And I mean, it's interesting because students do, they express some degree of reluctance to these things, but I always find that when I'm showing it to them, it, it's the same idea as the hackathon that I talked about earlier. It's about showing them, giving them tutorials, showing them yourself how to do the thing, and then also giving them options, I find. Um, so like, I know that they have to make in, in, in um, Dr. Galbraith's class that we go and help with, you know, the students have to make something like an infographic, you know, and I tend to do the strategy of, I like to show them um, a tool that they are already familiar with. And I teach them like Excel, which that's a whole other lesson that I have, but you, know, you can use Excel to go and make it make an infographic if you want to. Um, and then I also might show them a tool that they're unfamiliar with like Photoshop, but it still produces the familiar thing, you know, and always try to give them a mix and match of things that they might know how to use already and use it in a different way or things that they might have no idea how to use. Um, but I feel like just talking to them and talking out what the difficult part is and moving through it is, is um, helpful to sort of engage their reluctance because like reluctance is fine because that's still some kind of like, they're like, uh, they have like some kind of energy about it, you know? So as long as you can redirect it towards something, I think that's um, helpful. Awesome. And there's always YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, a lot of the times when we have students that, um, you know, ask about something, especially if they're working on something for a class, um, not necessarily working on a project that we're involved with, but they'll still come and, and talk to us about, you know, we're trying to do this in whatever class. Um, it's helpful nowadays, obviously, with YouTube, you can find a lot of good information out there on how to use these tools. I mean, I, myself, you know, I'm out there a lot looking on YouTube. Um, I'm working on uh, virtual reality projects. I'm working on augmented reality projects. Now, I do have a background in programming, um, but that was decades ago and, you know, there's new stuff out here now. So the reliance on, um, you know, personal one-on-one -on -one tutoring, you can also, you know, use those types of sources like YouTube um, for helping students get past the little humps. Um, because a lot of times they'll come in and ask me how to do something. It's like, here, let me go look on YouTube and then I'll send them the link. You know, it, it's not, um, I don't necessarily have it in my head, but I know where to look for it. You know, this is not only an issue with uh, students. I mean, I have a list in the back of my mind of like a bunch of projects I would love to be doing within our college. Uh, you know, there's, there's collections of various things out there. Um, and it, it may be that people don't have the time to investigate. It may be that, uh, you know, digital projects don't look like they have the same kind of value within a discipline as far as things like promotion and, and publication and things like that. Or it may just be a fear of, of um, you know, uh, not knowing how to use the tools. I don't know what it is, but, um, you know, we do have to do some convincing among faculty sometimes. Uh, you know, it's it's not always we get somebody like, uh, you know, our friend and colleague Rose Byler who comes to us and says, hey, I've got this pile of stuff and I know there's a way to do this digitally. Uh, so so let's let's do it, you know. Awesome, thank you so much. It looks like we have a question from Lena Bowman. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm, so I'm the digital humanities librarian at New College, um, and um, I'm talking a lot, as, well, especially this week, so this is very timely, about um, like thinking strategically with more direction about like what we're doing with um, digital humanities here. Um, and um, I guess moving in more of a direction rather than trying to do everything. Um, since 
basically this is a small college. So the digital humanities program is me. Um, so um, I was wondering, that my question is basically like, how have you guys thought about strategic planning um, and um, bringing the institution on board? Um, and yeah, how have you approached that basically prioritizing? Well, since this is a question about institutional stuff, maybe I'll start and we'll see what uh, the others have to say. But uh, you are right, some, there was convincing that needed to be done. Um, you know, like I say, we started this discussion really in 2004 uh, and the center was founded in 2007. And there was a lot of skepticism about, um, you know, the digital in the humanities uh, early on, I think, especially by senior administrators who, you know, did not see it within their own work and uh, were pretty skeptical about what it could add to, you know, what they thought was already happening in the humanities. Some of, some of what we used to convince them really was uh, showing them good projects that were done, not just necessarily by us, but by others. Um, I mean, there's just such fabulous stuff out there. And, you know, no matter what area somebody is in, we can probably find something that's really, you know, I think revolutionized, uh, you know, the field, whatever that field is. Um, you know, we brought, um, we brought people in to talk to our administrators early on as well. So we had brought people from well-established centers, you know, and senior administrators from other institutions in to talk to our administrators about what, uh, you know, DH had done in, in their places. And I think that um, helped a lot as well. Um, you know, they started to understand just how how this is in some ways, uh, you know, a wave of the future. I won't say the only wave, but a wave of the future in the humanities. And, um, you know, and, and it uh, convey, you know, it, it uh, enables people to get a variety of skill sets. Uh, you know, you can point to people hired to do a, a wide variety of things out of this. And so, you know, I think it's it's a number of different kinds of arguments. Um, frankly, I mean, the argument that I used at UCF that I think carried the day was I, I made a list of the top 15 institutions in the United States in terms of student numbers and showed that we were the only one that did not have a humanities center. I basically embarrassed them into um you know uh uh getting something and i think that uh helped carry the day as well and you know when you're big like this you can use embarrassment sometimes to uh um you know carry your argument but really i mean i think showing the actual uh activities and and getting people in that's just not you know local but if it's possible to get in somebody from the outside who can speak to this i think that can carry a lot of weight and then on the day-to-day -day, um, processing with projects and things, um, knock on wood, we haven't been totally overwhelmed yet, um, but there are times uh, when I first started at UCF, I mean, Bruce said the center started in 2007, they hired me at the end of 2015, and I was the first full-time hire for the center. So once I got on board, um, and we stirred up more uh, interest in the center because of my technical skills. I was able to, you know, start right in on helping to develop different projects. Um, Rose Byler, who we've talked about, uh, the Veterans Legacy Program, uh, those types of things. They, um, there were ways for us to reach out um, in these collaborative teams and some of it was the funding. So like the Veterans Legacy Program, we were funded by the um, National Cemetery Administration for uh, three years. Um, so the, that project, any type of project like that that you can get funding for um, also shows your institution that you know, you're meaning, you're doing what you're, you're meant to do. Um, but for projects that come in, a lot of the professors, they'll come talk to us, you know, we'll have a, a discussion, some we've even, you know, I, the ones who are really not sure what they want to do, we'll get them a WordPress site, or we'll find, we'll get them an Omeka database site, um, you know, and, and, and flesh it out enough that they can start putting their data in it and things like that. Um, but it's up to them to really think it through and sustain it. You know, I mean, we've had professors fall off the map. You know, we got them started, they disappear. 
um, two years down the road, they'll pop up again and they'll say, okay, I have time to work on this again. Can you help? You know, that kind of thing. Um, but for the things that are more in depth than we really have time for, um, is that's where we tend to rely on the, the computer science teams uh, because they have the time um, and they need it to graduate. Um, you know, they have the time and the compulsion to get these kinds of projects at least started. Um, so that is a benefit that a university of our size has. Um, like I had mentioned, um, think about, you know, talk, to, if you have a computer science department, go, go talk to the professors there, you know, the chair and find out if there's something similar at your institution that you may be able to partner, you know, with students like that to work on. It looks like we have a, a question from Ramona. Go ahead and unmute Ramona. Okay, hello everyone, how are you? Um, thank you so much for your presentation, it's very exciting. And um, I'm just wanting to talk to a few of you at another time, but um, I am at the African-American Research Library and Cultural Center in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I am a cultural heritage informatics librarian. And um, we um, did a project with <clears throat> the University of Arizona for a, a virtual reality Harlem Renaissance traveling exhibit. So we, um, we worked with <clears throat> Dr. Carter from the University of Arizona, and we traveled throughout the state. Um, I curated the exhibit, so you know I went to all these different locations. So I guess my question is a bit, what kind of community effort is your, is your program involved in? Um, because I love, I mean, the fact, I remember when I was at USC in South Carolina and I did some work with the Digital Humanities Lab there, but what I realized is that the ACT Academy is one world and the community is another. And because I am a librarian that kind of steps in both worlds, um, I'm really interested to know um, how you're addressing that if you are. And also um, in a world of inclusion and diversity, um, I, as I'm even looking, I'm the only one here that it looks like that is of color. And I'm curious to know what I, as a woman of color, can, can connect with, with you guys. Um, I come up to Orlando quite a bit, to the Bronze Kingdom, um, and I know that their collection is amazing, and I've been envisioning a DH project around that, that place, which is right in your backyard, as well as some things that I'm doing down here with the Florida, uh, Florida International University. We're part of a new grant uh, a data um, curation project, community data curation project. So it's involving an anthrop anthropology professor that left a major collection at our archives because we have special collections and archives. So we're going to be digitizing that. And um, we're also going to be doing oral histories related to the, the history of our library and the Cistron community um, in, in, in Orlando. So I know I said a lot, but if anybody would like to address or connect with me, um, I did make a note about your cemetery project because I'm the, also do genealogy. So that was like exciting. Um, and also your middle passage project that you mentioned. Um, I'm particularly wanted to know who did that and um, how can I find out more about it? And I'll stop at that point. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll start. Um, Giovanna Pineda um, is the history professor who um, is working with the Middle Passage experience. And um, we did reach out to the community here. Um, Hannibal Square in Winter Park um, is an African-American um, historical uh, library and uh, society. And we actually did a, um, a I guess you could call it a presentation. Um, we had a, the experience set up, uh, two different VR um, headsets set up in the uh, Hannibal Square Center so that the community could come in and um, have, you know, take advantage of the experience and learn about the project. Um, uh, Giovanna did um, um, interviews afterwards. So, 
We okay. tried to do a kind of, again, uh, like the other language learning game, we not necessarily a pretest post test kind of thing, but right. um, we did uh, reach out to the community members and talk with the ones who had gone through the experience. We did it both there and at UCF celebrates the arts, which okay. is a big, um, it's a like a two week um, College of Arts and Humanities uh, presentations and everything, usually downtown Orlando uh, during April, I want to say. Okay. Um, so we have taken that particular one out to the community to get community feedback. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned the Harlem Renaissance one. Yes. Um, I met Dr. Carter at one of the DH conferences. I forget which one. I think it was Montreal. Um, and got to see the, his presentation and experience. And it, it's just fabulous, um, the work that he's doing. Is. Um, but one of our colleagues in the history department that we've worked uh, with in the center, uh, Connie Lester, I thought I saw her on here earlier. Um, Connie Lester has been working on um, history harvests uh, where she and her team go out to the communities and, and do this kind of scanning stuff. And there's a project going on, I believe, at Jones High School, um, uh, the African-American high school in Orlando with digitizing their um, history collection and so forth. So we are doing that type of work. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, on our websites in a way that um, it's uh, there and accessible. Um, but I'll definitely, I can, um, if you want to email me or whatever, I can get you Giovanna's uh, email uh, information sure. and contact so if you information. Want to, if you want to put her name in the chat, you can oh, do that. Oh, yeah, I definitely. Can that, I can do that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, um, the VR stuff also I want to say is um, I'm involved with a company and we have VR glasses. Mm -hmm. They look like sunglasses kind of. And um, it's kind of been interesting to see people's response to the glasses versus the whole the headset. headset. Yeah. Um, so I would love to send everybody some information about those as well, if you're up, uh, you know, open to receive it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, there are a massive number of, of projects focused on um, you know, various diverse communities uh, within digital humanities, not, you know, I'm not talking just about Cheddar, but across the US yeah. and in Canada and in Australia and uh, Europe and so forth. Um, I, I've seen a list fairly recently on the number of these and it's, it's into the hundreds of, of right. projects. Okay. Which is really exciting, which is really, you know, great to see. I mean, I think one of the things about the digital is that you can really um, bring the kinds of experiences and the kinds of materials, uh, you know, together that, you know, it's just harder to do in a traditional book or an article or something like that. You can, uh, you can also um, have some of these things talk back and forth, you know, uh, you know, communities talking to each other in ways that it's harder to do on a static printed page. And so, so I think that potential has been really seen by a lot of people. Uh, you know, uh, Connie Lester was mentioned and she is uh, the head of a project called Riches here. And, and, you know, one of the things about our center is that we, you know, we have close ties to a lot of other projects that are not necessarily, you know, under our uh, umbrella, but, you know, sometimes they are, I guess, sometimes we collaborate with them in a whole variety of ways. And so Riches, started off as focused on the um, the history of Central Florida and is, has gone well past that at this point. And so they have a section on uh, LGBT history, they have a section on African American history, they have a section on even business history, on, on agricultural history. I mean, it's just all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, communities that they try and try and access that way. And so I think it's a really great project. And they too have been funded by NEH uh, I see uh, our colleague Connie Harper has just dropped uh, that uh, URL into the chat if you want to look at it. Okay, thank you. It, it looks like we're just about uh, at time, uh, but Ramona, that was a wonderful question because it, it gives us the opportunity to plug our next talk, uh, which does overlap with some of the things you were asking about. Mia, can you, can you get the, uh, the flyer up? Okay, perfect. So um, February 11th, we are going to have another Zoom session. And this one uh, actually will address 
uh, DH projects uh, as they connect to local communities and diverse constituencies. Uh, and so you might, uh, you know, we'd be excited to have you back uh, because, you know, our next talk is actually going to address some of these, these things. Okay. Uh, and so you'd have the opportunity to connect with uh, a, 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 another panel um, who, who um, are really interested in, the, in these topics. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, we would love to have you all back for uh, um, our February 11th talk. Um, thank you to our panelists to the, today. This was a really uh, enlightening discussion about what digital humanities is uh, and some of the tools that uh, cutting edge researchers are using right now to uh, really expand our understanding of the humanities. One last thing before we go, uh, we are going to send out an email. So please look for that with a survey. We would be uh, very grateful if you could just, you know, fill that survey out. Uh, it won't be more than just a couple of questions. And uh, just, you know, give us that feedback uh, so that we can uh, make in improvements and, and, you know, go forward for our next uh, speaker. Uh, for our next panel. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. This is great. Thank you. All right. Take thank care. You thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Amy, can you still hear me? Yes. Um, can I have your email, a way of reaching out to you, please? Sure. Um, you want to put it in the chat? Yep. As long as they don't Stop Set the, us uh... down. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll leave it up for a little bit longer. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank great. you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Look everyone have a great day.